Just curious um, if anyone's seeing any sort of activity or seen any trends towards the credit card and crypto space as it relates here. But I was wondering if anyone over the last uh, over the last week or so has seen uh, new scams coming up. So looking as well to our our participants here uh, from around the world. Um, yeah, uh, one I uh, <clears throat> caught recently um, was from the regulator in the UK, the FCA. Uh, they issued um, some guidance to uh, savers, particularly vulnerable elderly customers who might have pensions. It was the specific focus on pensions, um, playing on people's fears that um, because of this pandemic, the markets might be volatile, uh, their investments might not be as worth as much as they, they might have been previously. Um, so they've just advised um, savers and people with pensions to be extra cautious around this time of unsolicited communications or anybody trying to um, persuade them into making new arrangements for their pensions or moving money um, or things like that, particularly around their, their, their pensions and playing on the fears of the markets uh, to people, which is a different one from the others that I've seen, the usual text messages and emails, getting people to click on links. Uh, that's one that I've um, come across and another one which is a unique one um, slightly um, it's a mix of uh, how was it? it's a mix of uh, just a, a, a cyber attack and um, exploiting for money purposes um, is a tar uh, Interpol notice uh, targeting hospitals particularly um, locking them out of key files uh, that might be helpful for their critical systems um, until they pay basically um, whatever the, the cyber attackers are demanding, which I thought was unusual because they're actually trying to make money from it rather than just bringing systems down, which is what they did initially at the beginning of the crisis, merging two different typologies, if you will, into, into one. Cyber is definitely, um, I know from my side of the world too, it, it's something that we see it's, it's part of fraud, it's part of money laundering, it's part of everything now because everyone's, so many more people are connected, whether it's through their own home networks to their work, um, or it's critical, it's the one way to stay in contact with the rest of the world while we're all distancing. Um, so it, it seems to definitely form part of a lot of the emerging trends. Um, I believe Jeannie, you had your hand up and then uh, Amber, you're next. One thing that I've observed was uh, in companies that are reloading prepay cards, uh, reloadable cards, uh, there has been a, um, a spike in the past couple of weeks of uh, requests to reload a, a like, large amount of, of money into prepay cards. And uh, sometimes the source of funds is kind of like difficult to detect they don't have the information about the client. So I don't know if you guys have seen anything from a transact from a payment processing perspective. I think Amber, you had showed us a stack of prepaid cards last week. Um, right, that's what I'm going yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll pass it over. Uh, Amber, you had a comment and then I see Tamea has her hand up as well. Um, one of the things that, that we're seeing, and it's not a new scam, but we're increasingly seeing it, is just people doing impersonations. Um, and they're getting pretty brazen. So on any any groups like Telegram or WhatsApp, um, there are people that will impersonate relatively well-known people in the community um, and reach out in ways where they're trying to get someone to send, you know, send funds, send crypto, like do um, do things in a you know in a way where they're getting someone to send them something of value. Um, and in some cases. We're even seeing people making phone calls now. And I think that, I mean, maybe just because we're, we're all at home. <laughs> and so we're, we're maybe a little bit more likely to pick up the phone or, or pick up a message than we might be otherwise. Um, I've, I've seen a couple of folks that I would have thought of as being relatively sophisticated fall for those things. Um, and part of what the scammers have been saying is that like, oh, you know, like this is happening and my bank is being really slow because COVID or I can't go to the branch because COVID. And so I need these funds or I need these Bitcoins to execute this particular transaction. And if you can lend it to me, I'll pay you back with wonderful amounts of interest. And of course I can do that because I'm this person who's trusted in the community. And, and people are just like, oh yeah, yeah, let me let me do this for you. 
um, and and boom, fun's gone. They're probably anxious for some from some human contact or communication too, and that much more open to answering those calls, right? Yeah, and and the scammers are are preying on our wanting to help each other. Mm -hmm. Stephen, you had a comment. I was just gonna say, Amber is my hundred ether that I gave to Vitalik on then, is that what you're saying? Because I, I really was banking on that thousand percent rate of return. <laughs> uh, uh, for crypto, and this is between the group, uh, what we're seeing a lot of is people that originally abandoned the account. So basically, they did some type of suspicious activity. We asked them for more information or their KYC identification documents, and we've heard nothing from them. You're seeing a lot more people come back a year and a half, six months, seven months later, willing to give up their information now to kind of get access to their money. So we're seeing a lot of desperate uh, desperate measures that way where they're probably willing to take the risk now that they know they see that law enforcement maybe it has bigger and better things to, to worry about. Um, and to the point, I, I don't know if maybe to me and Ronell can help me with this, but I would be thinking with a lot of people getting $2,000 checks that are unemployed or self-employed, we might see a lot of deposits and pooling of funds into certain accounts for financial institutions as the pimps try to do their best to collect as much money as they can from their girls. But I'd like to hear your theory on that. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. But that's not new at all. The other thing that you might see is, so domestic violence, and I know we're talking about human trafficking right now, but domestic violence is on the rise as well, obviously, because when you are locked in with your abuser, it's just, you know, you take it every minute, versus when the abuser is leaving the home, you know, at least there's eight hours of a cool off period, so on and so forth. So now that, you know, women are leaving or trying to escape from a very abusive situation, they get into a domestic violence shelter and the first thing the husband will do is they are freeze their accounts or trying to clean out as much as possible. So you see both. You will see the pimp trying to access the funds, uh, her funds um, or his funds, whoever, whatever the situation is. Absolutely. And they are waiting. They are definitely waiting. So one thing I'll add is with that $2,000 that you were referring to, Stephen, it's actually from the women I know who are currently sex workers, they aren't able to access that because there's certain requirements that you need to have had earned $5,000, I think, in the last year. And so a lot of the work is cash basis. So they don't have any proof that they earn this income. So even though other people are able to access that, I've actually heard them say that they won't be able to access it. And so this is leaving them even more of a precarious situation. Okay, and I think we've got a comment from George as well. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. Just a quick comment on on just to consolidate a lot of the insights that were shared. There were, I think, from the enforcement side, we're starting to see a lot of aggressive maneuvering, at least from the international front, uh, from the United States, from Interpol, in terms of human trafficking itself. If if you guys can can raise some insights on that, I'd, I'd really love that. Thank you for your time. So there's a, a combination of things here. So with the pandemic, uh, FinTrack Canada's regulator has said, okay, we're going to um, allow you to file as quickly as possible. I'm, I'm over summarizing here, um, but it's not that they've said don't file on it in the interim or you can wait to file it. You should, you should do so as quickly as you can, understanding that um, some workforces are heavily reduced from the financial institution side. Um, and then of course, if you do have to file in a delayed fashion, there's BizDonks or the uh, voluntary disclosures uh, for for the delayed filings. I understand there's some fr frustration with the way this is being implemented, but I don't want to miss uh, what Peter's trying to get at here. I think you basically was saying that many FIs can't, um, they cannot tune their their thresholds and their automatic services and the automatic automation because they're working on BCP right now. So they're really working on a skeleton staff and they don't have the ability to what to Mia's point was, is kind of prepping and getting ready for what might be an influx when this is all said and done. So I think that might be frustrating uh, for some AML professionals that uh, the banks are just, un they're incapable of kind of assessing and having this ready for when, when we're gonna probably need it the most. Uh, yeah, and I would I would further echoes, uh, echo Peter's sentiment there as well, where many of the systems are based on, let's say, the last six months, a year, three years worth of patterned data. Um, we're about to change that, and we haven't seen this particular pattern perhaps in 100 years, or perhaps it's totally different. And as we go back 
um, there will be, I think, a lag as we try and get the systems or the humans to understand what's going on there. Um, and, and certainly if that is during a BCP time or a business continuity time, uh, that's going to be uh, extra tricky.